Okay, so basically we're gonna switch and I'm gonna bring you into my clinic and give you a couple case presentations rather than going over the talks. You should have those talks from last year in your, I'm told, in your, your, your materials. So basically this first patient is a 70-year-old female. She has a history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy in 2009, proxismal AFib since 2015, mild MR, breast cancer, status post chemotherapy and XRT in 2008 to 2009, hypothyroidism, hyperlipidemia, and she comes to clinic because she's having worsening dyspnea, PND, orthopnea, palpitations, lower extremity edema, increasing abdominal girth, uh, weight gain, and she's very fatigued. And you see that her medications there are DIG, Eliquis, Ferrosamide, Lisinopril, Metropolol, Potassium, Synthesat, and Spironolactone, Levothyroxine, Tamoxifen, and Magnesium. When you look at her exam, you can see that her vitals are okay. She's a little bit on the overweight side. She has jugular venous distension up to her jaws, crackles in her bilateral bases. She has a regular rain rhythm with a three out of six holosystolic murmur at the axilla, which radiates, or at the apex, which radiates to the axilla, and she's got a palpable liver tip. And she has a small fluid wave, uh, plus two plus edema bilaterally. Her EKG reveals that she's in normal sinus rhythm. She has a first degree AV block, low voltage, and an incomplete left bundle branch block. So what's running through your mind? I'm sure it's exactly what was running through my mind, that this is either non-compliance with medications or with salt restriction or fluid restriction because we know she has a cardiomyopathy and a reduced EF. She could be having more atrial fibrillation because that's in her history. She could be having worsening LVEF due to adverse remodeling or perhaps another myocardial insult. She could also have worsening mitral regurgitation. So I think the next steps, because her differential is pretty broad, is that you're gonna need an event monitor or a Holter monitor, something that, to tell you whether or not she's having worsening proxismal AFib and you're gonna need an echocardiogram. So this is her echocardiogram, and you, what you can see on here is that her ventricle is huge. So she's got a severely enlarged ventricle. You can see that the function is also severely depressed in the 20s. You can see that she has significant mitral regurgitation, but with these type ventricles, it's very difficult qualitatively to say how bad that mitral regurgitation really is. Here's her four chamber view and a contrast view. And again, you can see the left ventricle is huge, the left atrium is huge, so is the right atrium. You can see that she's got a defibrillator in there. Uh, and you can see that, um, again, this looks like a typical dilated cardiomyopathy with reduced EF. Here's the, looking at again at her mitral regurgitation. So you can see that it's significant, but again, in these type ventricles, because the Flow, the forward flow is so small, the version flow is going to be small, so it's very difficult to determine how bad it really is without quantifying it. So what does this patient have? Well, she has secondary mitral regurgitation. We also call it functional mitral regurgitation. Ischemic mitral regurgitation also falls underneath there. So it's anything that starts off with a myocardial insult rather than a primary valve problem. The others, mitral valve prolapse, those are a primary valve problem. So those are called organic or primary mitral regurgitation. What happens in secondary mitral regurgitation? Well, you have some sort of myocardial insult. That myocardial insult leads to that LV distortion. You also get significant papillary muscle displacement towards the apex, which tethers your cordae. So your cordae becomes really tight. And when that cordae become really tight, the mitral valve can no longer function well. It doesn't open much, it doesn't close all the way. And, and also you get annular dilatation of that, mit that mitral annulus. And all of those things, all of those myocardial things lead to that significant secondary or functional mitral regurgitation. So basically in this patient, so this is, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna try and quantify the severity of mitral regurgitation. The very first measurement is that vena contracta. So that's showing you how to measure that vena contracta, that nice yellow, blue, yellow red color right in between the valve leaflets. So her vena contractor turns out to be 0.5 centimeters. When you look at the guidelines, here's all the guidelines for determining mitral regurgitation severity, you can see that in the box there, a vena contracted between 0.3 and 0.69 is consistent with moderate mitral regurgitation. But with functional mitral regurgitation, it's never enough to rely on just one measurement because again, these measurements um, vary quite a bit with the geometry of that mitral valve. And there's a lot of assumptions that's a, that's a spherical mitral annulus. But in functional mitral regurgitation, it's no longer spherical, it's elliptical because the LV is, you know, it's, it's, it's enlarged in different directions. So these, this is looking at more quantification to try and figure out the exact 
uh, degree of severity that she has. You can see we're measuring the left ventricular outflow tract on the top. We're measuring the mitral annulus on the bottom, and then we're measuring the flow at those locations that we measured the left ventricular outflow tract diameter and the mitral valve annulus diameter. And you can see that that allows us to come up with a stroke volume at the top, and you can see it's only 16 mils. That's terrible. That's like cardiac output less than two, right? And you can see that her mitral valve stroke volume is 27. So we subtract 16 from 27 and divide by 27 because that should be the forward flow. And we get a regurgitant volume of only 11 mils, but we get a regurgitant fraction of 41%. So when we go back to our guidelines, you can see that the regurgitant volume doesn't really fit there in the moderate range, but you can see that the regurgitant fraction does because it's falling right there between 30 to 49%. And this is classic for functional mitral regurgitation. And in the 2014 guidelines, there was like a huge debate about maybe we should decrease the amount of regurgitant volume that you need in this particular disease, and maybe we should also decrease the PISA because of that very elliptical annulus. And it probably was the most controversial thing in the 2014 valve guidelines. There were tons of like letters that went back and forth about this. So in the 2017 updated guidelines, it was just put back the same way that it used to be, so that now um, functional or secondary mitral regurgitation has the exact same criteria as primary or organic mitral regurgitation with respect to qu quantitating severity. So we're gonna look at some other things. So basically on the bottom right-hand corner, that's very helpful secondary information. It's looking at the pulmonary veins and if you have a lot of mitral regurgitation, you have a lot of backflow into the left atrium, which is gonna increase your left atrial pressure so much so that you're not gonna have that forward wave that you see after that QRS, which is your systolic wave, your pul pul systolic pulmonary venous wave. You're actually gonna see reversal because the left atrial pressure is so high when that regurgitant jet is coming across. So in this particular case, we don't see reversal. If you look at the slide right up above, though, you can see that, yes, the filling pressures are elevated because that's restrictive filling because the E velocity is twice as high as the A velocity. And these others are just looking at, you know, qualitatively the severity of the mitral regurgitation based on the M mode jet, color and also based on the pulse wave. So this is looking at her tricuspid regurgitation. You can see that she has quite a bit of tricuspid regurgitation. We can calculate her PA systolic pressure um, using that TR jet, just using the mod modified Bernoulli equation, which is the, that peak velocity times 4, 4V four squared. And we can see that her PA pressures are also going to be elevated. They're going to be at around 46 to 50 millimeters of mercury. So what, is, so what have we learned about her? So based on all of this information, this quanti purely quantitative and this secondary supporting information, we, we've discovered that she falls in the moderate regurgitation severity, but she absolutely has signs of decompensated heart failure based on her echo. If we look at this guidelines chart, because this is all the primary, and you're free to look this up whenever you want, and tells you what the guidelines are for a primary organic MR. The secondary is on the right-hand panel, and basically you can see that with secondary, it always starts out with, if it's ischemic, you treat the coronary artery disease first. So if it's ischemic MR, which falls under functional MR, that's what you do first. If it's non-ischemic, like this patient, you're gonna optimize her heart failure treatment. You're gonna consider you know, resynchronization therapy if she has that complete left bundle with a QRS greater than 120. And she falls, because she doesn't have severe MR, she falls under that progressive mitral regurgitation um, or um, stage B. So she would need just periodic monitoring. In this particular case, her event monitor showed that she was having tons and tons of episodes of prolonged proxismal atrial fibrillation. So she was actually treated with antiarrhythmic therapy to get rid of her atrial fibrillation and we were able to get her back to a compensated state. Huey, do I have time for the one more case? Uh, about three minutes. Okay. So we'll do this one really quick. This is another patient. She's 64, another patient of mine who has a history of mitral valve prolapse with flail leaflet and severe MR and underwent mitral valve repair in 1998. She has residual MR, MS, mild pummeling hypertension. She has essential hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And her whole problem was she was having chest pain, palpitations, fatigue, dyspnea on exertion. Her symptoms were so severe that she had to stop her job as a warden in 
in the Huntsville jail system. So she had to stop because she couldn't even make the rounds anymore. Um, and even though she retired, she still had these debilitating symptoms that she couldn't comp complete her ADLs. And you can see her meds there, and you can see her vitals. I'm gonna point out that uh, her BMI is 34.3. She doesn't really have a murmur. She doesn't really have any exams of any findings of decompensated heart failure. So here was her TTE in 2004, which is five years after her mitral valve repair. You can see that her mitral valve is really thick. I'd call it moderately thick. The posterior leaflet is fixed by that annular ring, and you can see that there's some degree of mitral regurgitation. When we look at it on short axis, again, you can see the mitral valve is really thick. There's some calcification. There's some degree of mitral regurgitation. When we do the quantitative part, which is the continuous wave Doppler, we can see that her mean gradient is 5 with a pressure half time of 1.5 centimeters squared at a heart rate of 63, and her PA pressure is running right around 40. When you plug that into the guidelines, you can see that on valve area, she falls between mild to moderate, but the mean gradient also falls between mild to moderate. The pulmonary hypertension puts her more in the moderate range. So she was left with moderate mitral stenosis and some mild mitral regurgitation. This is her TTE after she presented with all those symptoms, because in 2004, she was asymptomatic. And basically, you can see that the valve doesn't look much different. It's very thick, still moderately thick. You can see the ring. You can see the posterior leaflets. Uh, fixed, and you can see there's some mitral regurgitation. Uh, we're going to zoom through this. This is a short axis picture, not too much different from 2004. When we do her quantification, what you see now is her mean gradient is 8, but, and her pressure half time is 1.7. Now, some of that is due to the fact that her heart rate is 10 beats per minute higher. It's now 73 instead of 63. You can see that her PA systolic pressure is exactly the same as it's 40. If we plug that all in, she still, except for the valve area now, puts her in the mild, but all the other findings put her still in the moderate range. So she still has moderate MS, and she still has mild mitral regurgitation. So you're wondering, well, what the heck happened? The valve doesn't appear to have changed, but she's very, very symptomatic. So what could have happened? Well, in this particular case, I pointed out her BMI. It wasn't that the, her valve was changing. It just was she was changing. She was getting bigger. And now she's absolutely obese, right, with a BMI over 34. So the question is, maybe this valve is no longer the appropriate size for her. And how can you figure that out? Well, the only way to figure that out is to do some sort of functional exercise study, right? And in this particular case, she had a bicycle stress echo. And it's showing you the different quads there. And basically what you can see is that peak exercise for her, which was only a heart rate of 109, which isn't that high, her mean gradient went all the way up to 20 millimeters of mercury, and she doubled her PA systolic pressure. Her PA systolic pressure went up to 80, which is that mild increase in, in, in exertion. So when we look at the guidelines, sure enough, she fits way on this left-hand panel where she's got, she's symptomatic, valve area is greater than or equal to 1.5, you exercise her. If that PA pressure is more than 60 or that mean gradient is more than 15, that is severe symptomatic mitral stenosis and you have to do something about it. So in this particular person, she went on, I thought for sure she would get a mitral valve replacement, but she actually had a repeat mitral valve repair and, and her mean gradient is a little bit less than it was. The most important thing I think is that she's no longer symptomatic and she's not complaining of all these symptoms that she had when she was doing her ADLs before. Okay, thank you.